Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, thank you for joining me here in TNO as we're going to explore the Republic of New Tomsk. Tomsk was ravaged by the Shtimoviki like no other city in Russia. Its beauty was smashed to rubble, the rubble pulverized to dust, yet life endures and small green shoots rise from the ashes of that grand old city. Based in the districts of the city that had not been leveled, amongst the local elites entrusted with rebuilding Tomsk as an imperial city were hundreds of former Bastillards, dedicated civil servants who secretly did all they could to resist the influence of Tabaritsky's empire. With the fall of the empire, though, a new government has been declared and a new republic swept into power, led by Alexander Zinoviev, the new chair of the restored Bastillard Association. Very cool. And here's the flag and Alexander, looking pretty cool. Does he have his own biography? Yes, he does. If you'd like to read about him, please go right ahead. Dust and Echoes. Alexander Zinoviev stands among the piles of pulverized concrete and marble leading up to the former Duma building in Tomsk. Shattered pieces of column and tattered posters alike litter the space that once housed the most honorable democracy in all of Russia. The former republic, the bearer of ancient virtue, was set ablaze by Daddy Tabby's madman. Now, the abominable two-headed eagle has fallen into desolation itself, and Zinoviev has nowhere else to turn to. <clears throat> he picked up a fraction of displaced marble and examined the Russian engravings, the whispers of democracy from before the wasteland. If any scholar could get a bird's eye view of ruin, he surely would have thought it belonged to a plaza from ancient Greece, not some pulverized remains of a recent Russian government. Zinoviev remembered how the Republic of Tomsk took its virtues from the ancient Greeks, so, so, sociability, conscience, benevolence, industriousness, to name a few by comparison, Tabarisky's regime was only vice. It wasn't long ago that Zinoviev was standing right here, side by side with Lekachekyov, Shostakovich, Karims, and Sakharov in the glorious Duma campaigning for the future of Russian progress now. He was the last one standing. The dying fate of Tomsk now rests in his hands alone. Tabrisky's men tried to douse the flame of Russia's last hope and nearly succeeded in purging the degenerate liberalism for good. The last flicker in the torch was sway side to side unprotected from the raging wind. Tomsk has today to count and recover the dead lying in the wake of Tabaritsky. But tomorrow the city must rebuild. Democracy hangs by a struggling thread of hope in the middle of Siberia, but Zinoviev knows what he must do. Voices from the past beckon a new era in which our society development is going up by quite a bit. Pretty impressive by Tomsk. Very impressive. Uh, except for army professionalism, of course, and nuclear stockpile. <clears throat> Green and blue. A rag, dirty group of scavengers walks away of what what was once Tomsk, looking for any sign of previous life neglected by Tabaritsky's men. Nothing persists more than the smell of moss and dew with a faint hint of smoke as the scavengers travel deeper into the rough Siberian forest. Discarded wood, piles of ash, and crumpled marble litter the landscape, of course, not one could forget the two or three charred bodies every two hundred or so yards. Deep into the forest, a polished rectangular wooden box rests among the teal gas or grass and the black dirt. A closer look reveals inhuman claws marks along the top half of the box. Whoever found this box before had pried it open violently. The leader of the group slowly and easily lifted the opening of the box, revealing the looted corpse of Boris Pasternak, the founder of the Republic. All of his valuables were taken from him, but his body remains in one piece, much to the group's surprise. The scavengers pick up the coffin at once and return home. The remnants of the Doom are delighted to see Pasternak's body recovered and in good condition. The older members recall how Pasternak fought tooth and nail to maintain his sacred democracy against all opposition. Younger members recall stories of Pasternak's fervent determination to see Tomsk thrive as he worked until his last breath. The Decemberists take pride in knowing that Pasternak was one of their own, and they vigorously insisted that Pasternak be given a proper reburial. The shining white sun begins to set, illuminating the bright green grass as the Sembras gather on a large hill overlooking the river Ob, each one holding onto Pasenak's polished coffin. Dark green trees reflected against the sparkling river as the sun grows dimmer. The Decemberists now bow their heads in one final moment of silence dedicated to the great founder. He who worked tirelessly to persevere or preserve the Russian dream. The body is laid to rest, the curtain of night and stars descend slowly respectfully. Thank you for your service. We got low taxation here too, as well as early mobilization and export focus. Interesting. Hmm. And we have the National Spirit Legacy of the Salons. Very cool. We have Crumbling City. Ooh, not good. And Assaulted Earth. Funeral Dirge. Ilya Platonov, 32 years old, killed by bullet to the head. Lana Mukhova, 7 years old, died of starvation. Maxim Zilkin, unknown, approximately 57 years old. Upper body badly degraded by tabloid exposure, provisional identification supported by dental records recovered from local clinic remains. Unknown female, some years old, remains brutalized beyond identification. 
On and on goes the grim task of tallying the dead. Those few who remain of the humanist faction have made it their duty to identify every soul silenced by the reign of the Mad Regent, and to give them what little dignity that could be afforded to them. It is far easier said than done. Most bodies are already in advanced stages of decay. Many have been damaged beyond recognition, and often there isn't even a next of kin left alive to make a final confirmation. Yet the tired, broken men and women who had once dreamed of a better world toil on. What few bodies can be clearly identified or turned over to their families, if any still live. In many cases, the workers only have antidotes or anecdotes, and what few records have escaped the fires of the Regency to make an educated guess, it isn't heard of for two separate bodies to be attributed to the same person. The humanists give it their all, but in the end there are still so many bodies to account for, or unaccounted for. When the task is done, they began to dig. A section on the edge of the ruins of Tomsk is turned into a mass grave for all those who could not be identified. Upon the site, the humanists erect a monument to the unknown soldiers and innocents. Crafted from the rubble and detritus of the broken city, it bears a message of mourning and a hope that such a tragedy might never be unleashed again. As the men and women stand solemnly around their last great work, a bitter finality sits upon them, for they know that this grave does not merely represent their lost ones, but something far, far greater. There lay buried the corpse of Russia. No draft exemptions for you. Free press, night vision. Ah, oh, since we're here, we might as well. Let's see. Let's go and grab some strellas, because we can. Why not? Improved anti-air. Even though we're not going to be playing as this faction for very long, I and mean, that's okay. Core population of 1.6 million. Wow, not very much. <clears throat> the guttering light. The modernists weep when they return to the Academy of Sciences. The crumbling ruin of what once had been the House of Learning is structurally unsound. Having been so thoroughly torched by the Stumoviki and the rampage through the city, almost all of the old records have been destroyed, and only a small portion of its equipment still functioned. One of the old technicians sits cradling the remains of his facility's pet ca cat for several hours. Eventually, the men and women of science realize that the time for mourning will not last forever, and soon they will need to salvage what they can of their old lives. With the husk of the academy as their base of operations, the most skilled surviving engineers of the modernists set out to bring back some semblance of order to the land. The old politics of the city are now irrelevant, and other factions are busy with their own priorities, so the modernists mostly go where they please soon. Some limited amenities at the academy and in the surrounding area are restored, but without reliable power and water supply, there is little more that they can do. So, their attention turns towards the power plant. The nucleus of the old city had been bombed harshly during the region's march. The materials needed to repair it are scarce, but the power it could provide is too crucial to pass up slowly. The engineers got to work. Without proper equipment, the work is grueling, even deadly in some places. Several died ele ele to electrocution, falling debris and other accidents, but they still toil. Finally, with some trepidation, the modernists activate the main generator and cheer as it spiders into life. They know that many tasks still lay ahead. Restoring the infrastructure needed to supply the power to the city will be a Herculean task in itself. For now, though, they are content with small victories. Amidst the des desolation of the new Russia, they have found the light. It is better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. Secularism, huh? All trade unions allowed? Cool. Quote immigration, outlawed slavery, darn. Darn, darn, darn. And skilled refugees only. Hmm. Bent but unbroken, the best of lives have always stood for Russia that is strong and defended against the dangers levied against it. Once they would have strived to build an army and industry to rival the world's great powers, now they can only hope that their people have enough food to starve off starvation. They are now the leaders of the Republic of New Tomsk, merely by virtue of having the most members to survive the region's madness. While the other factions trifle over the ruins of their old dreams, the Bastelard return to the well-being of the people. Under the leadership of Zinoviev, they have established kitchens and makeshift clinics amidst the ruins of the old city, even going so far as to reach out into the surrounding villages and towns. They do what they can to attend to the basic needs of the people, and with what little food and medicine, of course, remains. The kitchens are a microcosm of the new Russia. Broken men, dead-eyed women, and starving children all come to be fed and treated as best as the Bastelards can manage. They become a small beacon of normality, where the people come together to nurse their damaged psyches and find comfort in their shared trauma. The damage caused by the reign of terror lingers in the mind as well as in the physical world, but they're under the care of Xenoviev's men. The people can find some semblance of healing. In the old Tomsk, the Bastelards were often regarded as a coldest of the factions, caring more about the strength and sanctity of Russia than the people who lived within it now. Only after Russia had been so thoroughly shattered beyond repair, the people can clearly see that they did truly did care. A people's strength comes from many places, and in times such as these, the Bastelard sought only to secure the strength for the people to survive. Strength in iron, strength in bread. But that concludes all the events for the Republic of New Toms. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link, as I always say at the end of every video, and I will see you tomorrow in another one. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day.